Hello everyone, Simon Jacobson here. And we will be speaking about how to feel even when you hurt. It's a sensitive topic, but an important one because none of us will go through life without some pain, without some wounds, without some hurt. And uh, it's one of the areas in life actually that uh, we often make big mistakes in how we deal with these challenging times. Now, it's one thing how you deal with good times, but dealing with difficult times, where you usually resort and gravitate back to either bad habits or things we picked up at home, or society's attitudes, which are not often the healthiest way to deal with uh, pain and painful situations. Especially in this day and age, the painkiller age, we can call it, and the quick fix and instant gratification, many of us find ways to numb ourselves instead of dealing with a challenge, to numb ourselves instead of actually experiencing a challenging situation the way we should. And that's why I think this is a critical component in uh, finding a meaningful life because as you learn better tools to actually deal with <laughs> with more difficult times, those tools can help you not only in difficult times but in all times. Because in general, it's an opportunity to really go and uh, so-called improve and tinker with your own inner workings. So let's begin with a very most uh, obvious, uh, maybe not so obvious, a, a parallel. You know, when a person is uh, one of the most natural and healthy instincts and reactions to when we feel pain is to recoil and to protect ourselves from being hurt. We don't want to be hurt. We want, we, we want to protect ourselves from things that hurt us. For example, if you, if God forbid you put your hand near fire and your hand feels a burning sensation, what are you going to do? You're going to pull your hand right immediately back reflexively to, to, to uh, d limit the damage and not get more damaged. So one would seem, <laughs> it would seem likely then <coughs> that the same approach should be when it comes to psychological or emotional pain that when we're dealing with a traumatic situation, a situation that um, a personal loss or a, another form of trauma, our instinctive reaction should be to attempt to escape or retreat from the loss of, uh, and the agony of that particular situation. And we're perhaps often tempted to do so. But is that really the correct approach? Because think of it this way. Imagine never allowing yourself to love or care about someone so deeply that it turns you into being vulnerable with the potential of being hurt. If you're going to go with the instinct of protecting yourself, then you basically will not allow yourself to really have relationships. Because the fact of the matter is that um, part and parcel of a true, and a, and a true relationship, a genuine emotional connection, is carrying the potential, opening that door, and which always leads to the potential and possibility of being hurt. So if a person says, I don't want to be hurt under all circumstances, it also closes off true emotional relationships. The fact of the matter is a loving heart can also bleed. So then the question is, so how exactly are we to deal with challenging situations if we're not going to pull back and not going to protect ourselves as we would with physical pain, then how exactly do we deal with it? Well, the difficult, the difficult truth is the fact is, is that as the expression goes, the only way out is through. When it comes to emotional challenges, emotional pain, the only way out of that pain is going through it. Which means we have to learn how to allow the difficult situation seep through our beings, the hurt to seep through our beings and discover that not only does it not weaken us, but it actually makes us stronger people. And that is going to be the theme of this discussion here which, as I said earlier, is a very complicated one because even though log <coughs> logically what I'm saying lo makes sense logically, but there's an issue here because when we are in an emotional weakened state, when we feel hurt, we have our instincts and reflexes that don't always serve us well. They may try to protect you, but they may not really be the right reaction that you should be having to these type of situations. So what we need to do is really enter into the recesses of our inner psyches, and how they deal, how that psyche deals with uh, difficult situations, 
and 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 this, and the, and the, the consulate, the motions, and so on, and discover what are the mysterious secrets of our inner soul, our inner self, that can help feel pain and come and and allow it to become and transform it into seeds for growth. That is what we're going to be addressing here. So let's go back to what I initially stated, which was the discussion of the actual way we react to things. Our instincts and reflexes are often very good because they protect us, as I said. When you feel a burning sensation, you feel other pain, you immediately react. But when it comes to the emotional, it's a far more complicated issue because it's not just about protecting yourself, it's also about experiencing life. And experiencing life, by definition, is a sensation. So if I want to pose a hypothetical question and say, you know what, because of the pain that life brings, because we can have anguish and we can have aggravation, would it be better, would you prefer, if you were able to press a button or take a pill that shuts off all sensation so you don't feel anything? It's like becoming numb, shutting down your nerves so you don't feel. Would that be a preference? I know some people who have suffered a lot and actually sometimes have a temptation to, to try to do exactly that. That's where they may drink themselves to oblivion and they may numb themselves through other type of self-medicating or other, other ways of escaping from a situation. When in truth, what happens is, it, instead of really solving the problem, it just buries it, so to speak. Like uh, one, one person who had a lot of chronic back pain told me, he's passed away since... He said to me, you drink. He became a very heavy drinker because he had this chronic back pain. He says, you drink because you think you can submerge. You can drown your tsaris, your, uh, your problems. And then you discover that problems float. You can't drown them. They come right back up. But you keep trying because that is the inclination for most of us is just to forget about it, just to avoid it. And if we can take a painkiller, or we can take a drug, or we can take a drink, or gambling, or other releases that just sort of speak, soothe you and comfort you for the short term, that becomes the go-to so-called drug, whether it's physical or psychological, emotional or sexual or, 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 or other forms of it. That's the go-to that you just r run to instead of really dealing with the situation. This, in a way, would be one of the biggest critiques of uh, drugs and alcohol. I'm not getting now into the medical effects that it has on a person and addiction, but the mere fact that instead of dealing with the situation, you have a way to sugarcoat it, you have a way to gloss over it, that alone tells you that you've never really dealt with the problem. You've never been man enough to just face it and deal with it head on. What is the issue here? Which leads us to understand that a big part of why we do that is because of fear. Fear of confrontation. Sometimes also the fear that we can't really solve the problem. So those fears and many others contribute to us not going and addressing it. Because if we were very clear, you know what? If I could have a conversation, if I can take the bull by the horns and address it, then I'll, and, and I know it would help, it's one thing. But there's the fear of confrontation of upsetting someone or the fear of, as I said, that it may not help. So you say to yourself, why do I even have to risk it? Let me just take the easy way. Well, it's not really the easy way, but let's call it the short road, the short, long road, which is like immediate uh, numbness, immediate um, comfort, immediate way of, of uh, as I said, sugarcoating it, to try to relieve some of the, relieve yourself in the short term. Now, there are circumstances, maybe not such serious ones, where maybe that could work. That's like, you know, a person may have a mild headache. They take a, an aspirin, they take an Advil, they take a um, Tylenol. But if it's indeed more than that, just a mild headache, if it's indeed a reflection of some type of dysfunctionality or some serious problem emotionally, then all these medications just take away the feeling, the sensation doesn't mean it takes away the problem. So you don't feel the problem, it's like being asleep. It's like being in a coma. And, there are, and, and many of us, that's exactly what we do. We avoid it by turning our, we start becoming either in denial or we minimize or we just ignore certain situations and we, and we say, you know what, let me just forge ahead in other areas and ignore that. Obviously. <coughs> if it's a little deeper cut, so you may want to do something, treat it, make sure no infection, put a Band-Aid, uh, cleanse it, 
sterilize it. And, uh, and just protect it. And basically that just facilitates the healing process because the same healing process is going to take hold that the blood will clot and again a scab and at some point it'll fall off. Now let's say for argument's sake you just don't like the whole idea of seeing blood or the pain involved. Instead of dealing with it all together you just like uh, make believe it didn't happen. So if it's a mild cut, fine. But if it's a deeper cut you can end up having much serious more screams and infection can start festering. The bleeding can, 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 and the infection can spread. The bleeding could start becoming internal or other things, all because you didn't want to deal with the discomfort of the situation. And you could have nipped it in the bud. Instead, it could become a monster. And, 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 and most serious illnesses don't start just serious. I mean, there are very serious illnesses, but they all begin at an early stage. If you can catch it at an early stage, they say most things can be contained or even prevented. But this is the, but so most of us are not going to say, you know what, I better look at it because maybe there's something more going on. So what happens now in the emotional and psychological? We also have natural immune system. You know, we have a certain natural resilience that if something happens to you, let's say you're walking down the street and someone curses you, a normal healthy adult is not just going to go crazy about it. You know, they'll, uh, they know how to take it. If you're immature or you're uh, particularly uh, very uh, volatile, you may react and it may bother you, it may even turn you into becoming violent or something of that sort. If it's some coming from a person that's closer to you, again, a healthy, normal person has a certain resilience. We don't react to every ins insult or every negative experience. But then if something becomes more serious and there comes a point where you do react, well, you shouldn't necessarily be reacting, meaning it overwhelms your immune system, it overwhelms your natural resilience. Then what can happen is you can reciprocate. You can start yelling back. You can become, get into a spitting match, figuratively or literally, a punching match, also figuratively, you know, and, uh, or literally, and it just, it just escalates into a whole battle. Fire fighting fire. This happens all the time. Many of times our reactions... Even if, even if we were legitimate, we have a, a, a legitimate grievance, but our reaction could be just as much part of the problem as the initial thing that was done to you. Now, I'm not blaming, obviously, the one that first initiated the problem is the one that is to be blamed. And with a spark, can end up becoming burning down the whole building, God forbid. Same as psychologically, emotionally. So where do we learn the tools to deal with this? We all have a born, inborn natural and innate natural resilience. But where do we learn the tools beyond our capacity resilience? It's just like anything. You know, a body can take that much. If somebody, let's say, shoves you, you your body has resilience to deal with it. But what happens if it's a, it's a stronger blow? Then, it, then Same thing emotionally and psychologically. You could take a certain amount, but if it's stronger. So where do we learn? The first place we learn is from our parents. Or we don't learn from our parents. We see and pick up and assume we absorb the attitudes of how they dealt with things. For example, if a father, when he got angry, he yelled. And what would the mother do, his wife? She would retreat, silent. She'd go into her room. Children see this. See it on a, especially if they see it on an ongoing basis, and they learn there's two ways to react to a problem. It goes back to their natural comfort. Those parents, why are they doing that? Because probably they saw it in their parents. I'm using a simple example. It could be a little more complicated. There's passive-aggressive. There's aggressive. There's passive. Some people's the other way around. Someone starts yelling. The other party starts yelling as well. And you have a yelling match. Now, most people prefer it cold war than a hot war. But is it better or worse? They're both terrible because they're both really not adequate tools. Again, I'm not talking about a one-time thing where someone says something to you, you know, you think they're in a bad mood. You know, you go into your room and say, let me diffuse it. We're talking about a pattern, a routine of not solving a problem, but going one of these different approaches. So children who are impressionable just, and assuming and adapting
unhealthy methodologies from the adults that that person was surrounded by. I'm not going to go through every possible reaction, healthy or unhealthy. I'm just giving that, that the, the context to the discussion of what our discussion, which is about how to feel um, and how, how, how to be titled it, how to feel, how to feel even when you're hurt, which really means how to allow yourself to experience your experience and not avoid your experience. Now, interestingly, just as a side, maybe it's not an aside, when it comes to joy, it's also possible. There are people who really are very unhappy with themselves. They don't like themselves. So when they celebrate, let's say a wedding party, some other holiday, their celebration is not, real, is not really uh, completely coming from within them. They celebrate, and on the outside it looks like everything is happy, but a person like that is never really happy. And even that celebration is almost a masquerade. And I've heard it from many people. They felt, you know, I had to put on a good face, and I did, and fine. But I'm really not... Was ...called the blow, <laughs> and you know how to absorb different, different challenging situations. I'm talking about the escapism, an escapism that really flows both ways. It could either go into a happy state. It's more likely sometimes, well, it's actually, I don't know if it's more likely, but it's more obvious maybe when it comes to negative situations where the person avoids really dealing or addressing with it. But I would say that that same person will probably also have or often have issues with happiness and good occasions that they will be able to maybe, as I said, masquerade, but it won't really be completely engaging. So what is an emotion? What is an emotion? Emotion is a reaction of a live human being to an experience. That's an emotion. Dead things don't have feelings. A corpse does not smile and does not cry. Doesn't feel, does not feel pain and does not feel joy. We don't know much about the inanimate world like uh, minerals, vegetables, but you could argue a stone also does not feel. Maybe it does in its own way, but let's for argument's sake, the way we understand feeling. So the whole, the meaning of an emotion of feeling is an ex, you're experiencing something. Now, experiencing something, we all agree is a good thing because that's what makes you alive. That's what being alive means. You experience things. As soon as you experience things, you can rest assured that those experiences are not always going to go exactly as you like it. And here's where the, dilemma, the problem comes. I want to experience it, but I want to experience it on my terms. I want to experience it, but only in a pleasant way. But not all experiences are pleasant. There are challenging situations, there are difficult situations, there are even painful situations. But experience is experience. If you want to experience life, experience is synonymous with feelings. And feelings are synonymous with all types of feelings. That's the spectrum of feelings. It'd be like saying, you know, I love to taste different foods, but I only want to have one type. It doesn't work that way. A food will have different tastes. Salt has its taste, and sugar has its taste, and it's bitter, and there's sweet, and there's, uh, the, the, there's tangy, and there's all the different... This, this. You may have preferences, but the whole idea of experiencing the palate, experiencing the different, um, the different, different your taste buds, is diversity. Same thing, you want to experience, let's say, music or art. It's a, it's a wide spectrum. It's not one song. It's musical notes in many different combinations. Now, you may develop a preference to a certain type of music, to a certain type of art, certain type of foods. But experience is experience. If you suddenly... ...or uh, trips, whatever it is, these are experiences. Experiencing life to the fullest means an emotional bandwidth, the full spectrum of emotions. And those emotions include, yes, times of pain. You cannot choose and pick. You can't say, I'm going to have all the experience, but I will only want pleasant ones. It doesn't work that way. So you say, but why I'm uncomfortable, why would I like a pain? But that's what we're leading to, as you'll see, that it's not the pain, it's the experience. And if you can turn that pain into an experience, then the experience teaches you something and makes you a richer person, even the difficulty moment. So the difficult moment is difficult at the moment, but it's not difficult in the big picture because it leads you somewhere. And that's how we have to look at it. That's called allowing the pain to seep through you. That means the only way out is through. Not because we have no choice and we can't take a side door. 
which is also true. You can't really escape things in life. But that's not the only the point because there's no choice. It's because it's actually healthy to feel. If someone hurts you, do you think it's healthy for you to be able to, to, to develop a tool that says, no, I'm not hurt. I'm superhuman. I'm a superman or superwoman. I'm not hurt. Nobody can hurt me. That is a lie. That is deceiving yourself. That is creating a numb, a numb st like state that just makes you feel comfortable, but it's not really true even. <laughs> what does a healthy person say? Yes, you, you said something that hurt me. I'm entitled to right now say I am hurt. What's the difference between these two people? The first one doesn't even feel entitled to be hurt. That they, have to, they have to feign and create an illusion that nothing hurts me, I'm, I'm, I'm invulnerable. The second person has value, self-value. My self-value tells me I have been hurt. Many people don't want to confront, confront a hurting situation because of the insecurity, like I mentioned before, or the feel of helplessness that, that they maybe deserve. Or you know, they don't feel the, 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 the dignity that I can protest. You said something now that is not appropriate. Now, of course, as I mentioned before, not everything that's said to you and not everything that happens to you, you have to react. But many things you do should react. That, that devastating line that you hear often, that the silence was worse than the rape. You hear that? The silence was worse than the rape. How could that be? Because the crime, the violation, is horrible, terrible. A nightmare, a holocaust. But when well, you have one thing that remains, the dignity of your soul and spirit that you're allowed to cry, that you're allowed to say, I've been hurt. Once that's robbed from you, then what's left? Then you don't even have the dignity to say that I was violated. You don't even have the dignity to say that, you know, my feelings matter. Even that's invalidated, then there's nothing left. Not only were you hurt, you're not even allowed to say you were hurt. You don't allow yourself to say you were hurt because you're terrified of the consequences. Like people, like I mentioned a few, a few weeks ago, someone told me his whole life, 45 years, he never cried. He told you can't cry, babies cry, his father, his abusive father told him. So what happens with all the tears? They didn't like go away, they implode. He cries inside. And they become knots and knots and knots that tie him up like a kettle that's boiling, but the spout has been sealed. So it can't cry, it can't cry out, it can't escape, there's no release. What happens inside? You become a complete mess, a wreck. And when I tried to hug that fellow, he was literally like a piece of concrete. That's how tight he was. No release. So it's true, we'd rather not be hurt. But if there's hurt, we have eyes. Eyes have openings, and your tears can come out of your eyes, like the steam out of the pressured, uh, pressured kettle that's being overheated, that's been boiling. We have the expression to cry out, we cry. We can protest, we can say to someone, you have hurt me, you've, you've not done something, what you did is not appropriate. That ability to cry out, to protest, to speak up, what they always say, break the silence, is a tremendous power of healing because what it does is it counters the invalidation. It says, you know what, the violation happened, that made me feel like I'm worthless. But I'm not worthless to the extent that I cannot protest it. And the protest and the, op the discussion, the breaking the silence, that becomes your oasis because upon that you can start building your dignity again. So it's not about just going and saying, okay, I want to tell everybody what happened to me. And just, you know, I just get it out of me, out of my system. Deeper than that, much deeper. It's the validation that you are entitled to say something happened wrong. So then... If you think about it, the dignity of a human being and the experience of feelings is experienced sometimes through the joy, I'm entitled to be happy now, and I'm also entitled to be sad, and I'm entitled to be, um, be asked to be, to, to, uh, to, some, to the person who hurt me to ask their, that they should ask me forgiveness. It's a t in sense of entitlement. It's not a demand, it's not an ego thing, it's the human the decency, the, the natural dignity of a human being feeling things, sometimes feeling something positive and sometimes feeling something negative. And that's really what means the only way out is through. Because if something happens, you can't get out by going back. You can't go out, get out by going through side doors. 
You have to allow the experience to seep through you. It's not easy because it's painful. And it's much more, the, and we all have a temptation to avoid it. But that is ultimately where you see the real growth come. You allow yourself to experience it. And you say to yourself, I was hurt, and now I'm experiencing my pain. Now, obviously, wakeful situations are actually an opportunity, an opportunity to look at ourselves and travel into a part of ourselves that we are not necessarily comfortable going, but you learn more about yourself through pain than you do through joy often. Because it's the place that you want to retreat, it's the place you feel lonely, it's the place you feel un misunderstood, the place you feel helpless at times and hopeless. And the only way is vengeance. I'm going to put that person, let them be at my mercy. I want to get them to their knees. That would be what some people think would be getting back control. But you're not that getting back in control. You're just getting even. You're just trying to reciprocate what was done to you in return. It may give some people satisfaction, but I can't see how that could be a long-term solution. And let's say you get your vengeance, and then what? Another way of regaining control is by completely becoming oblivious. As I said, numbing, it never happened. I move on, I'm a new person. You develop a new personality. That's regaining control or simply escape to, a lot, to another land, another, air, another world, to be able to just avoid the pain. And the third way, and the only way, a healthy way, is saying, no, I'm not running away. I'm not going back to tit for tat in a vicious cycle. I'm going to acknowledge and accept my vulnerability and even celebrate it and know that life sometimes beautiful things and sometimes painful things. But I want to feel my life. I don't want to be a numb, <coughs> comatose zombie. I want to feel. And part of feeling is feeling even some things that, didn't, that weren't, weren't, weren't pleasant. And I feel it, and that's how you gain control because of blaming others, of denial, of um, insecure, and all that comes with the insecurities. So emotional intelligence is working on your emotions, emotionally developing and growing. Now it's interesting when you think about it, in that context, you have like this. You know, naturally when a person is born, we have our mind, we have emotions. Early on, obviously, they're all in the stage of a very uh, childish stage. And um, I'll soon spell out the different three stages. But the first stage is very limited intelligence, unlimited emotions. A child, a baby born, a newborn, knows enough instinctively to cry when it's in pain or hungry or something bothering it. But it doesn't communicate yet. It doesn't have developed feelings. And it doesn't have developed intellect. What happens next? It happens everything starts growing. The child's mind starts growing. They begin to pick up things, recognize people, understand. As the child develops, it begins to grow in education, broadens its, begins to speak learns things, explores <clears throat> emotionally. Also, emotions begin to develop as well. The child starts having an emotional relationship with its parents and siblings, with friends, begins to relate to another. But in younger stages, the child is still a pretty much a selfish creature. Not selfish necessarily in a bad way, but it doesn't yet understand how to co totally contain, totally relate to another person. The child still thinks in terms of what, what, what's, what, what about, what's good for me? And then as we grow, what happens is, most of us grow intellectually, but emotionally at some point we don't continue growing. So for example, if a little child went over to you right now and started scratching you and kicking you, if you're an adult, most of us are not going to get down our, on, our arms, on, on our hands and knees and start kicking back, right? I hope. Because you understand it's a child. But what happens if an adult suddenly insults you? You can end up being just like a little child and immature. The only thing is, you've grown, so you're smart enough that you're not going to have a tantrum in the street. But you may have a tantrum right in here. You ever see people with road rage or other things? Perfect adults. But they suddenly something ticks them off. They become literally like babies, but they know how to hide it. Hopefully. If you don't know how to hide it, then you really. So that, that's a person whose emotional intelligence has not developed. At some point, their emotions are still the same fragile, vulnerable person that, does not, that the only way they can deal with things is through control and so on. They hide behind their mind with mind games, the intellectual type of approach, but they really have, the mind has grown. They've become more diverse in knowledge, more erudite, more knowledgeable, more educated, more information, but emotionally, 
someone could be 30 years old, intellectually and chronologically, but emotionally maybe 15 years old, 20 years old. And you see it when they are ticked off. You see it when they get upset. Emotional intelligence means you continue working with your emotions. Now, as I said, most people, their, their, their emotional growth is stunted and aborted because of the adults that they're around and they see their parents are that way. They don't know how to deal with emotions. They don't know how to deal with strong emotions. So they either are too aggressive or too passive, everything I mentioned before. But if you're around healthy parents, you're around a healthy environment and you have a measure of healthy self-esteem, self you realize, you know what? It's maybe important to have an emotion. I, I see my father or mother know how to cry. They know how to argue. They know how to discuss. They know how to express their feelings. So then your emotions have a model which to follow, which means to continue growing. How do I experience emotions? Instead of just avoiding a painful situation, find excuses. They learn to cheat. Why? Because they want to win at all costs. A healthy approach will say, well, let's go through the feelings Yes, you lost the competition. You feel bad today? Yeah, I feel horrible. But you know, you're going to learn from this. Because you feel so horrible, you're going to work harder next time to be better. So your, your ad, 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 adversary becomes your ally because he or she is helping you by their resistance. It's like someone pushing you this way so it gives, builds your strength to push the other way to develop a deeper strength. And next time to be even better. So instead of being a sore loser, or someone who doesn't know how to lose, or someone to lose themselves thinking that they're winners, you learn, learn from the so-called loss to become greater. This is called the only way out is through. You're emotionally experiencing things. And you're experiencing positive things and sometimes setbacks. But you, then you realize the setback is a stepping stone for further growth when you experience it. Because one, not one, you're in control of it. You've made an active and deliberate decision that you're going to feel this sense of loss or the sense of pain or the sense of, of, uh, of um, not getting what you wanted. And then you determine also how that can be turned into a catalyst for growth. That is emotional growing. Good teachers, good parents will teach a child emotional intelligence that way how to deal with it, those, those, those difficult times, those setbacks, those losses, when you don't get what you want, but you get something even bigger, you get experience. You know, like they say, the man with experience meets a man with money. What happens? The man with the money ends up, I'm sorry, the man with money meets a man with experience. So the man with experience ends up with the money and the man with the money ends up with the experience. Okay? The man with experience ends up with the money and the man with the money ends up with the experience. Because the one with experience knows how to maneuver. He has experience. And the one with the money doesn't say so he loses his money, but you know what he gains? Experience. He gains and sees how, to, how it works. So everything in that sense is a building block to growth. Using the famous example I've given many times from the Baal Shem Tov. Baal Shem Tov is an example of the, the in Yiddish Schwindel trap. Schwindel trap means a swindling staircase, or what we call a spiral staircase. But why is it called a swindling staircase? Because it swindles you into thinking that you're not climbing. When you go up a straight staircase, it may be a very high, tall staircase, hundreds of steps, but you see a destination and you get closer to every step. When a spiral staircase, which is many times used to preserve space, works like this, it's spiral, which means you're not straight. You climb up, you make, then you make a turn, and your back is faced to the top. Even though you're higher, you see less of the destination than when you are on a lower step. And then again, and then another revolution of that, to the point that you're about to reach the apex to the top, and you turn your back completely, and you can convince yourself, I'm not, I haven't made any progress. Seeing it through. The only way out. So the style speaker he uses as an analogy of this constant life, there's going to be setbacks. There are going to be times when that we are not close to the destination, when in truth, you're right there. But you have to, the trees go to sleep. And then there's spring, when they wake up, reawake. Swimmer is not the person who swims all the time and knows how to swim even against great tides. It's unknown, it's, uh, it's spontaneous, it's painful, it's risky. Allowing the experience. Now, 
the key thing is also to know you have to have a good antenna, or that's why you need sometimes an objective mentor to help you determine is this spontaneous act healthy? Because you can also get yourself into trouble if you don't monitor it. So I'm not just suggesting a free-for-all, obviously, but it's a combination, and that's ultimately what emotions are about. Very different than intellect. Intellect is like a computer, machine, your mind, your memory, you retain, you, 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 you um, research, you listen to things, you retain knowledge, information, you process, you come to conclusions. The mind we have mastered in many, many ways, much, much easier. The emotions don't work that way. Emotions have fears, emotions have resistance, emotions have all kinds of phobias and stuff that should I experience, should I not experience, because it doesn't have that intellectual po uh, firepower of processing and the confidence in processing data. That's where you find many great geniuses, but emotionally they're like babies, they're immature. Emotions you have to deal with, first of all, conflict, conflicts. You have to deal with conflicting feelings. You have to feel, deal with joy and pain sometimes right near each other, like a snowball. And you have to deal with confusion. You have to deal with an emotional subjective state. Subjectivity is always more complicated than an objective, an, an objective idea an idealistic idea, a concept, a theory. But emotions are, 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 the way we deal with emotions is experience. Intellect is not an experience. Computers don't experience anything, though they process tremendous amount of information. The mind itself, without the heart, can be a processor. Smart brain, give me data, give me numbers, and I'll get, crunch them and I'll give you the results. The heart experiences. In Yiddish there's an expression, the heart's leptiber. It means, it, uh, how do you even translate leptiber? It endures, more than endures. It uh, fully experiences leptiber. It's like completely being there, engaging with life. That's emotions. And engaging with life is always much more complicated than standing as a bystander and looking at it through a glass, like some the scientists think they can do. It means you're not objective, you are a part of the drama. And there are consequences. And there are times it's going to be comfortable and sometimes not comfortable. And you are on the line. There are risks involved. But that's what makes it so great. Like they say, the greatest risk of all is not taking any risk. To play it safe. And the mind says, you know what? Why don't, you, why, why, don't do anything. Don't take risks. Every risk can be dangerous. That's not how the emotions think. The emotions want experience. They engage. As I said, look at young children. They need to learn not to get into trouble and danger, but they are natural engagers. They engage in experience. You see the sparkle in their eye. The experience, they look at you and you feel the warmth. You feel something exudes. Then you see sometimes people, God forbid, they look like they're dead. They're alive, they're smart, but they're all protective. They have very thick protective armor and there's no way to just have a, you know, a, a natural smile. Everything is controlled. They know what masks to wear for the different people they meet. And then you find people who are just at ease with themselves. Smiling comes easily. Crying comes easily. It's just a full, full range of experience. Like I said, a free spirit experience that does not have any, any constraints to its wings and to its, uh, and to its uh, expression. That is ultimately what emotions are about. And part and parcel of that is letting a painful feeling to be felt and hurting through the process. Now, obviously, when you're dealing with physical pain, if you can uh, limit, limit the pain and painkiller, of course you do whatever it takes to make the pain, but I'm talking obviously on a psychic level, an emotional, psychological level. And there too, I'm not suggesting every pain has to be experienced to the fullest. If uh, painkiller is necessary or even a medication that m makes things a little milder so you can deal with depression or other challenging situations, by all means. But your goal is not to get stuck in it and addicted to it. Your goal is to be able to experience it and become a greater and stronger person. In addition to the fact that our own body secretes chemicals and fluids that in the brain and other places that actually help reinforce and, and intensify your own immune system and your own confidence level and your own happiness and your, and your security to be able to those, uh, those attitudes and those chemicals that can help you. So much more can be said on this topic, but uh, I will... Um, suffice with this and I hope that you know as always these things are recorded so you can listen to it again I always welcome anybody's comments and questions and thoughts 
and, and reactions because I really believe talking about an emotional experience, emotions is a breathing, inhale, exhale, it's an engaging, interactive experience. I share my thoughts and feelings and I hope you can share your thoughts and feelings and we validate each other, even if we don't always agree. We validate because we validate our, our right to express ourselves. As I've said many times, the ultimate freedom, you can express yourself. You can ask questions. Pesach, we ask questions, it's freedom. We ask questions because you're allowed, you have a right and dignity. In history, for thousands of years, people were silenced by the monarchs, by the church, by other authoritative, authoritative uh, despots and fascists and so on. But the ability to express means that you have a right to express yourself. And I'd like, I'm, I'm proud to say that I believe that the Meaningful Life Center and all we do is in that spirit that we are embracing and we celebrate people's independence and celebrate people's and, and autonomy and ability to really experience life to the fullest. So please see us as a resource like that and um, let's exchange, cross-pollinate and all that comes with emotional interaction, emotional intelligence and growth. And please continue to submit or suggest any topics that we could address. We're here for you and we are here to try to create a uh, kindred spirit connection of um, souls that intersect like different musical notes of one large composition. Everyone be well. Have a very blessed week. Next week there will not be a live class, meaning on location. We will, I'll record a class because I'll be traveling to South America, to Argentina, to bring some of the words of hope there. And, uh, but I will be back here in two weeks live, but those listening online, there will be an online class next week, and we send out a weekly email announcing this. So if you were listening to this and don't have that email, don't get that email, please just subscribe to our weekly email list. Just go to MeaningfulLife.com. Everyone have a very blessed week and an emotionally rich week where you feel all the feelings, all the tantalizing, and all the different, uh, the entire spectrum of human emotions in the fullest sense of the word. Everyone be well and God bless you. Thank you.